his robes for mine, O oh, wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, Christ suffered neath God's rage. Draped in his righteousness, I'm justified. In Christ I live, for in my place he died. His robes for mine, what cause have I for dread? God's daunting law, Christ mastered in my stead. Faultless I stand with righteous works not mine. Saved by my Lord's vicarious death and life. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, God's justice is. Jesus is crushed, and thus the Father's pleased. Christ drank God's wrath on sin, then cried, "'Tis done." Sin's wage is paid, propitiation won. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, such anguish none can know. Christ God's beloved, condemned as though his foe. He as though I, accursed and left alone. I as though he, embraced and welcomed home. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My own. My praise, my all. My praise, my all.
Hello, ladies. I am so glad that you have logged on to listen to this week's lecture. I am Sarah, one of the substitute teaching leaders here, and I am excited and very nervous to give my first lecture. Let's start off in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the technology that allows us to have fellowship with each other, but still get to listen to lecture. I pray for a softening of heart while we listen and learn from Jesus' Sermon on the Mound, and that we can walk away wanting to be more like you, Father. I pray that you just calm my nerves and um, that I can speak your word. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Have you guys ever seen the 1950s pamphlets, the ones that would tell you how to be a perfect housewife? They have been floating around social media lately, and I caught myself reading one one night. Some of the things that they say are, prepare ahead of time a dinner for them to be ready when they got home from work. Prepare yourself for their homecoming by taking 15 minutes to freshen up and to touch up your makeup and maybe put a bow in your hair. Make one last pass around the house to clear away any clutter. Start a fire for him in the cooler months. Fluff his pillow and take off his shoes. My personal favorite, don't be frustrated if he comes home late or stays out all night. And most of them would always end with, a housewife always knows her place. As a flawed human, I can't imagine living up to these expectations and the failure housewives must have felt if they did not meet them. I also wonder if the husbands truly felt loved from their housewives when they followed all these rules out of obligation and not out of love for them, as if they were checking off their list to prove to society that they loved their husband. As we continue reading Jesus' Sermon on the Mound, we get to watch as Jesus expands the law of Moses, taking it from a checklist of things that people would do to prove to others that they loved God or behaviors done out of obligation to God, to a heart change, to having your love for God flow through your actions. It's easy to look at what Jesus is saying about the law and become overwhelmed knowing that there's no way to uphold these laws every second of every day. But Jesus knows this. God knows we are going to fail and we're not going to be able to live up to his standards, but he has a plan for us. And spoil alert, that plan involves Jesus dying on the cross. Today, we are going to break up our text into two parts. The first part is verses 17 through 20, where Jesus is going to completely change the way people should look at religion. He is going to take it from a list of laws people felt obligated to obey, as if they were something to check off their list, to a heart change, where our actions are stemming for our love for Jesus and our want to be like him. And then in verses 21 through 48, Jesus is going to explain how we are to express this new love for him in our actions. So our first division is Jesus radically changes religion. Jesus is coming on the scene and saying, you guys have been doing it wrong this whole time. All these years, it has been wrong. God is not asking you to have a list of things to do or a specific way you need to go. Um, or specific things you need to do to get into heaven. Jesus is saying your behavior doesn't really matter if your heart is in the wrong place. God wants your heart to be changed for him. God doesn't want you to behave out of fear, but out of love for him. And what is right in the eyes of God has nothing to do with our rituals, but our heart. As adults, don't we want our children in our lives to behave out of love and respect for people around them and not because they are scared that they're going to get into trouble? Jesus is saying the same thing. He wants our behaviors to stem out of our love for him and our respect for him. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 and start reading. Verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So when Jesus says law or prophet, he is talking about the Old Testament. And more specifically, he's talking about the first five books of the Old Testament. So Jesus is not coming to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. 
and Jesus is going to fulfill the law in three different ways. The first way Jesus is going to fulfill the law is by obeying the law perfectly. Jesus is the only person in the world who has come and obeyed the law of Moses perfectly. But he's not going to obey it the way the Pharisees have created it. But he is going to obey it in its original form, the way God intended the law to be upheld. And that leads us right into our second way he is going to fulfill the law. He is going to explain the law the way God intended the law to be. The Pharisees had taken the law God gave Moses and manipulated it into this beautiful exterior. They have added to it and they had taken away from it. You can think of their law as just this beautiful exterior house that you've admired for years. And then when you had the opportunity to go inside, you found out that it was rotting, moldy, and filled with trash. The Pharisees' laws changed people's actions from the outside, but they didn't really care where their heart was as long as they were following the law. The third way Jesus is going to fulfill the law is with his sacrifice. The whole Old Testament book is pointing to a savior, this king who's going to come and save his people. And that king is Jesus. And like all good books, we want there to be an ending. And most readers hope for a happy ending. Jesus dying on the cross is our happy ending. Jesus dying on the cross means his followers don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be that perfect exterior house. Back to verse 19. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So what is righteousness? In its simplest explanation, righteousness is doing what is right in the eyes of God. I'm not going to go into much more detail on this because your notes will explain it really well. Um, Verse 19 is conveying the importance of keeping the law. If you set aside the least of these laws and start teaching people wrong, you are going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying you can't just pick and choose the laws that you like and get rid of the ones that might be hard or unpopular. He's pointing out that's exactly what the Pharisees have been doing. And they have been taking the law and and choosing the ones that they like and getting rid of the ones that they don't. He then is going to point out the Pharisees' flaws even more. The Jewish community would have held the Pharisees on this pedestal of perfection. They would have been able to keep the laws um, that they created. But Jesus is about to push them off into the ground. Most Jewish people would think they could never be as righteous as the Pharisees. And now Jesus is saying that they need to be more righteous. This would have been devastating to them. They would have thought this impossible. And Jesus, again, is asking for perfection, or they won't enter the kingdom of heaven. But that's Jesus' point. You can't be perfect on your own, so you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. He He is changing the way religion works. He's saying it's not a bunch of rituals you have to do or behaviors you have to follow to get into heaven. Jesus is coming to bring religion to your heart, not just to your actions. A true heart change is what God wants from us, not a bunch of robotic behaviors or check marks off of our religious to-do list, which is our first principle. Jesus doesn't want obedient robots. He wants obedience out of love. Are you following rules to check off your list of good behaviors or relying on your behaviors to please God? Because that's not what God wants from us. God wants our love for him to change our behaviors. Now, Jesus doesn't just drop a whole new way of looking at religion and then walk away and make us figure it out on our own. He takes the time to give us examples of the way that we should see this new righteousness play out in our lives, how the outpouring of our love for God is shown in our behaviors and our actions. Our second division is Jesus gives examples of this new obedience. We are going to see Jesus start six different examples to make his point that the Pharisees' rules were not what God had intended. He starts each one with, you have heard that it is said, but I tell you. 
He gives you the law that was given to Moses. But then he's going to take it a step further. Jesus is going to expand on the law to what its original intentions were. Verse 21 says, You have heard that it is said to the people long ago, You shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the courts. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. You should not murder. Did you read this and think, sweet, something I can probably do on my own? Well, Jesus took it from the act of murder to the attitude behind the action. And I'm going to make an educated guess and say that every woman listening has felt anger at some point in their lives. His listeners are now being told that even harboring anger in our heart is the act of sin. And most of the time, when we harbor these feelings inside our heart, they will at some point spew out of us into our actions and into our words. And that's Jesus' point when he says, again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka. Raka is an Aramaic word meaning empty-headed or worthless. He's saying that your anger will eventually come out in hurtful words towards your brothers and sisters. You may think that your anger is under control and no one really knows what you're feeling towards a specific person, but Jesus is saying that one, God knows you're angry, and two, most of the time, your anger comes out in your actions. Your friends and family can tell when something is bothering you, and most likely, if you are truly angry with a person, People around you can see it as well. It's just not something we can easily hide. Jesus also wants us to extend forgiveness to the people who have wronged us. And sometimes this has to be given without an apology or an acknowledgement of the wrong that has been done to us. Jesus is asking that you work on your heart and not let it become hardened. I do want to hit a little bit about forgiveness before we move on. Forgiveness and trust are not the same thing. Forgiveness can be given to someone who has hurt you without extending the same amount of trust you had. God is asking us to forgive people who have angered or hurt us, but he is not asking us to put ourselves in dangerous situations. He did not say we had to extend the same amount of trust to that person again. Verse 23, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. If you are coming to God in worship, but you have someone who is angry with you, Jesus is saying to leave and go reconcile with them. His listeners brought their gifts to Jerusalem, so they would have had to travel 81 miles to give their gifts. And he is saying that even if you did travel 81 miles, that you need to go back and seek forgiveness. This is how important it is to God that you don't live with anger in your heart or allow others to live with anger in their heart towards you. You are not responsible for other people's anger in their heart, but if you don't seek forgiveness for something wrong that you did, then you are allowing them to continue down a road that you know is sinful. Settle matters quickly with your adversaries who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid every last penny. You are asked by Jesus to settle matters quickly. Jesus doesn't want us to allow a disagreement to just be left or just to be swept under the rug. Jesus is using this example of a payment of money but we can apply this to any aspect of our lives. When things are left to fester in our minds, we usually will create um, a scenario where it was maybe harder or harsher than it really was if somebody has hurt us. Or on the flip side, if you were the one in the wrong, you may start thinking that like, maybe it wasn't such a big deal and they maybe are overreacting. And if we allow this to take root in our brain, it is a much bigger deal Um, to seek forgiveness or to give forgiveness. Verse 27, you have heard it said, 
sorry, you have heard that it is said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one body, part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. I'm going to read verse 28 a little bit differently. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a man lustfully has already committed adultery with him in her heart. I think it's easy to kind of skip over this verse as women because it's talking about men. But this is a sin that even women stumble on. In Jesus' culture and in our culture today, adultery is the act of sexual adventures with someone other than our spouse. But Jesus' culture would have included sexual adventures before a marriage. We as a culture have kind of thrown that one out the window. But Jesus is agreeing with his culture that sexual adventures outside of the marriage in any form is adultery. But he's also adding on to that, saying lustful thinking about another person is also sinful. What we feel in our hearts towards someone and imagine in our mind that is not our spouse is adultery. Now, lust is not acknowledging when a person is attractive or even commenting on their attractiveness to another person in a respectful way. Lust happens in our mind when we take it that step further and start to create scenarios of the two of you together. And that is what Jesus is talking about here. This is such a big deal to Jesus that he states, if this becomes an issue for you, that it is better to lose a body part than it is to continue to go down the road to hell. The word hell here is, um, or the word that he uses here for hell is Jehenna, which means the city dump, where the refuge was burned in the valley of Hinnom outside of the ancient city of Jerusalem. So this was a very visual place for his listeners to see. Jesus is taking this punishment to the extreme. And he's most likely not to be taken literal on this point. It is more of a metaphor to show, just to show how serious God takes this offense. It's not just about the actions of adultery, but what's in our heart that God cares about. Verse 31. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a, certi a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. To the first listeners, divorce was rampant, and mainly in part of what the Pharisees were allowing by the law. Divorce was a simple procedure of giving a wife a document dissolving the marriage. This released the husband of any claim or responsibility on the wife. And in Jesus' day, a divorced woman could either find another husband or turn to prostitution to live. They could not just go out and get another job. There were two different views on divorce that the Pharisees took. They had a liberal view, and they called that the school of Hillel. And they argued divorce on a variety of causes at the discretion of the husband with no remorse towards the wife. It was very much just a dismissal. And then there was the moderate view of Shaham, and they argued that divorce permitted, was permitted only on the grounds of sexual infidelity. We aren't going to go into very much detail about Jesus' view today, mainly because he talks about it in more detail in chapter 19, but also because he's talking to the Pharisees here and explaining how they are doing it wrong because they're not listening to their heart, but they're just following the law. Verse 33, again, you have heard that it is said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the law the vows, or sorry, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for that is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. Oaths back in Jesus' day were really interesting. They were used as a legal contract in a way, and the Pharisees were the ones who made the decision if they were binding or not. 
and just like everything else that the Pharisees were doing, there were loopholes. The Pharisees would swear on different items and then back out, stating that they had the right to do so because they did not swear by God. If you were to swear by temple or God himself, it was always binding. But if you were to swear by land or a person, maybe it wasn't so binding. They really manipulated what was and wasn't binding for their own gain. And Jesus is saying that's not how God wants us to interact with each other. He points out that it doesn't matter if you swear by anything on earth because it all belongs to God. All of it is his, not just the temple. He finishes by talking about or by he finishes talking about oaths by saying in verse 37 that all you really need to say is yes or no. People should be able to take you at your word and believe you without all this oath swearing. Your integrity and reputation should be what allows people to know you're going to tell the truth and follow through on what you said. We, as the people of God, should be the ones who are always known for following through on our word. Jesus is moving on from motives for our actions to more of how we should behave towards our enemies in verse 38. You have heard that it is said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you, take his shirt and hand over your, sorry, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. In the ancient civilization cultures, slapping someone on the cheek was a really serious insult. Both the Jewish and Roman laws permitted persecution for this offense. But Jesus is telling his audience that if someone does this to you, don't retaliate, but turn the other cheek. He's not saying that we need to take abuse. We just don't need to get even with people. Retaliation was looked on as a right. In the Jewish and ancient civilizations, they had legalized vengeance that was monitored by the court systems. But Jesus is saying it doesn't matter if it's legal with the court systems. God is asking us not to seek retaliation, and sometimes we just have to let things roll off our shoulders. In our culture, giving someone your coat doesn't seem like a very big deal. But in the ancient culture, it would have been huge. The poor would have only owned their loincloth or undergarments and one outer layer. And by giving this away, they were giving away all their protection from the elements. And even with a population that wasn't poor, you would have never just walked home in your undergarments. Jesus is again asking, um, or Jesus is again using an extreme example to show what is in your heart and how that your belongings shouldn't really matter. Verse 41, he is referencing a Roman soldier. They were able to make a person walk one mile with them to carry their bags. No questions asked, no way to get out of it. It really didn't matter what you were doing. Now remember, the Jewish community was inside Roman control, but they did not like that. They looked down on the Romans, and in return, the Romans looked down on the Jews. And the Jews just did not have the same rights as the Roman citizens. And Jesus is telling his community to take the Roman soldier bag two miles instead of one. He's saying to lovingly serve those who oppress you. Verse 42, give to the ones who ask of you. Jesus is asking us to be gracious givers. He's not saying we have to impoverish ourselves and give everything we own away. But he is asking us to give and to give willingly. Giving should never be about what you get out of it, but about how you can help others. Also, giving doesn't always have to mean money. You can give your time and your talents to those in need. It's easy to hear someone talk about giving and just think, oh, I can barely pay my own bills. How am I supposed to give to somebody else? But remember, providing a meal for a family or a couple hours of free childcare to a mom in need, those are both giving of your time and talents. Serving in the children's program so those mothers can come here and study the word is giving. Jesus is not specifically asking you to give money. He's just asking you to give of yourself. Verse 43. You have heard that it is said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. 
that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain to the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward do you get? Are, you, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than the others? Do not even the pagans do that? Hating your enemy was not part of the law, but not loving your neighbor was stated in Leviticus 19, 17, and 18. Do not hate other Israelites in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly, so you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. So the lawmakers took that and ran with it. They took this and created a tradition of loving your neighbor, but hating your enemy. Which was also a cultural thing. It wasn't just something the Jewish people did. The Greeks had a saying to uh, learn from your enemy's criticism, but they would also say that you should always hurt your enemy than they hurt you, or hurt your enemy more than they hurt you. Enemy isn't really a word our society uses often, but I think we can really put a lot of different words in this. Jesus also used evil person, which we certainly have evil, evil people in our society. But we can also think of it in terms of people who are different than us, maybe politically or religiously. Enemy is also a really strong word. So it's easy to think that I don't have any enemies, but do you have people you dislike? I'm going to venture to say that we all have people in our lives that we dislike. And how do you treat these people? Do you pray for them? Do you want them to succeed in their endeavors? Or do you secretly hope that they fail? Jesus is asking us as followers to love those who don't love him. He ends his point with a really good gut check. He's saying, don't the unbelievers love people like themselves? When I read verses 20, or sorry, when I read verses 46 and 47, I think Jesus is being a little bit sarcastic here, which I love. Saying, oh, you are kind to the people like you? Good job, let me get you a prize. But he follows it up with, don't the pagans do that? Pointing out that their standards were to live up to the pagan people living around them. Jesus is calling us out saying that is not what God is asking of us. God it wants us to be like him, not like the world. Which leads us right into verse 44, or 48. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. He's calling, us, he's calling us to be perfect, not only in our actions, but also in our heart. Do you read this and start to get a little anxious, thinking, there is no way I am ever going to live up to what Jesus is asking? Jesus is pointing out all of our flaws, not to give us anxiety, but to show us how much we are in need of a savior. The whole intent of the law was to point to the fact that people can never do this on their own. We would always need a savior in the end. And they, but the Pharisees forgot this, and they started thinking that they were good enough on their own. Jesus is asking that we strive for perfection, for, for righteousness, to be perfect in the eyes of God, but with the knowledge that perfection is never something that we can achieve on our own. And that's okay, because as believers, we get to clothe ourselves in Jesus's righteousness. We get our blood-stained coats cleaned with his righteousness. This does not mean that once we have accepted Jesus in our hearts, we are done. We get to just check that off our list and think that everything else we do in our life just doesn't matter. Jesus just spent the last 37 verses explaining how that is not true and that how our lives here on earth do matter and that we really need to strive to be more like God every day. But he's not asking us for obedience out of obligation, but out of love for him, out of our hearts, which only God can change, which brings us to our last principle. Only God can radically change your heart towards obedience. Even with the knowledge of how the law was intended to be, we still can't live up to it without help. Only with God can we even attempt to live up to what Jesus is asking us. But that's again the point Jesus is making. We are unable to do this on our own. But we are supposed to try because we love him. In what ways are you acknowledging your sinful behavior but not your sinful desires? Are you attempting to hide your heart's desires behind outward performances? 
Our good enough will never be good enough. Our hearts are in need of being transformed by God. And the only way to do this is by putting our trust in Jesus and receiving the Holy Spirit as our helper. We have to change our obedient behaviors from the inside out. Our external behaviors will, never, will, will always reflect what is in our heart. So if we have Jesus in our hearts, his righteousness should be what flows out of us in our behavior. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for the explanation of religion, where we don't have to be perfect, where we don't have to be, or we don't have to just do all these actions um, and behaviors to get into heaven, but that is what our heart is that gets us into heaven. We also thank you for not leaving us in the dark, but showing us how our love for you should flow in our actions and our behaviors. I pray that as we go on with our day, we are able to see areas in our life that may need a little work, areas that we need to work on so that we can continue to grow in the likeness towards you and in our love for you. It is in your name we pray. Amen.